Hello and welcome to today's European SharePoint Office 365 and Azure Community Webinar. My name is Shane and I'm delighted to be joined by Stefan Bisser, MVP, and Thomas Goels, MVP at Solvian Information Management Austria, who will be talking to you today about Microsoft Teams and Bot Framework, a developer's perspective. Remember to join in the conversation about today's webinar on Twitter. Our Twitter handle is at European SP and our hashtag is ESPC20. Don't forget to check out the Resource Center. This is updated daily with the latest blogs, ebooks, webinars, and how to videos. Simply visit SharePointEurope.com and click the content link at the top. Interested in taking part in ESPC20 in Amsterdam this November? Call for Speakers is now open at SharePointEurope.com, where you will also find details of our 30% discount offer. After the webinar, we will have a questions and answers session. Type any questions you have in the questions window. Questions will be selected and answered at the end of the presentation. This webinar will be recorded and you will be notified by email when it is available on the Resource Center. And now I'm going to pass you over to our webinar presenter, Stefan and Thomas. Hello, Thomas. Good morning. Hey, and welcome. I'll just allow you to present there. So take it away. Perfect. So I'm sharing my screen, everything good. And then we head it off with PowerPoint for a couple of minutes. All right. Um, Welcome from my side to our today's webinar. Um, we're going to split this webinar basically in two parts. Uh, I will head off talking about Microsoft Teams, more focused on all the development stuff you can do inside of Teams until we reach the point where we talk about bot, because then we head over to my company, Stefan, who is an AI MVP. Um, my name is Thomas Gölles. I'm working for a company called Solvian in Graz, Austria. I'm an Office Dev MVP. Um, yeah, pretty active since like three or four years ago in the whole community around Europe. Um, and Stefan is my coworker, uh, and he will be talking about the AI and bot framework component in Teams development. You can reach us on our blogs or just send a short message on Twitter. We're normally pretty active on that platform as well. Okay, let's get started with uh, Teams as an app platform. Um, when you think of Teams uh, as a platform for development, of course, uh, you have uh, the basic Office 365 applications as a, as a bottom layer, where you can make use of Word, Excel, PowerPoint, Forms, Planner, uh, Power Automate, and all the stuff. That's a given because it's part of Office 365. On top of that, the Teams already has a pretty active partner store with around 600 uh, applications you can consume from the Teams App Store. For example, Poly AI, uh, a cool tool for creating custom polls. I will show you that later. And of course, a couple of different applications from multiple vendors, um, pretty, yeah, um, pretty big companies like Adobe or GitHub or Trello are already uh, developing uh, apps for Teams. And today we wanna show you how you can do this as well and how you maybe can consume apps that are already available in the App Store. Um, the idea is that on top of those apps that are brought to you by Microsoft or your partner ecosystem, you also can create your apps on your own. And then there are, in a Microsoft view, uh, two different uh, type of apps. One is more an organization-based app like department tools, employee resources, support info, so more a general application. And then, of course, vertical solutions that are more focused on a vertical, like healthcare, manufacturing, and retail. Um, we will talk about today about how you can create something that is available for all your uh, employees and maybe something that is more tailored to a person's need, so a personal uh, application as well. Um, so what is the Teams platform? In short, um, you can create uh, applications for Teams as commands and actions, tabs and model pop-ups, bots and connectors, or UX integrations. Um, but in a more general uh, way of speaking is, you don't really create an app for Teams. You create an app on a different platform, for example, the bot framework, or for a tab on an Azure website, for example, and then you hook up this application into Microsoft Teams. So it's not natively something you store in Teams. It's more like creating an application and then using the app manifest file, a JSON file that is uh, available to edit just in the 
uh, App Studio inside of Microsoft Teams to connect your experience with the native Teams um, client. So basically, you not really are developing something inside of Teams, you are more working in an environment like next to Teams and hooking things up that then show up in your Teams environment. Um, all those things, of course, are part of the Microsoft Graph, so you can take advantage of all the great stuff that is available in the Graph API. Then a big part is the Bot Framework SDK that is used to create bots uh, and connectors and also some of the task views. And of course, everything you do is available inside your Teams client on your desktop PC, in the web, or as well on the mobile phone as a mobile client. So you can reach across devices. Um, two important things. Teams is not only uh, a platform that you can use to create your own um, applications as a company, as such, as like an IT department or a development crew, but also as an ESV. Uh, so you can create really Teams and store it in the global store. There isn't current any story about how to make money inside of a team store. It's more on your own, how you charge your users for your services. If you are building services that should be available for the whole world, so to speak, um, you can take, for example, the Adobe uh, app that is available in Teams. When you connect to this application, the first thing the application asks you is your Adobe account. So all the billing, all the thing is then handled by you. So it's not a Teams thing. It's more like Teams is providing the platform and all the billing and all the stuff you need to take care of yourself. Um, and also uh, pretty recently, I think like six months ago, they published a certification and a testing scenario so that you can have a look at all the different apps inside a Microsoft uh, web page where you can see um, Microsoft is pretty, pretty, pretty um, looking into the applications you store into the store uh, in the global store. So I think it takes you two to three weeks to get published because they're really looking through the stuff. What is what are you doing? What is the code doing um, so that you don't get the spam or different? Yeah. Uh, apps like we have all in our mobile phones that maybe are not that useful, but still available. Uh, and Microsoft is taking care of that, that only selected apps are really, really going through the store. Um, to have a look at what's more of the, of the new stuff that was announced at Ignite for Teams development. Um, for example, here you see a message extension. So uh, a, a pretty uh, decent example is also the Wikipedia extension available in Teams. You can just can type inside your uh, command box and then the message extension pops up and gives you an idea and add some text to the search for, for example, or a compose extension or also the same thing on top in the command box. Um, you can also use the same tools to create a small task form so that you pop up a form inside of Microsoft Teams that it's highlighted and your end users just fill out um, some data forms and you then can take it from there and do your workflow, do your process, whatever you ask the uh, customer or the end user, and then take the data from there. Um, another cool thing is that when you look at this example, you have here a, a simple message action. So this is just a, a demo message from some persons, and we will hook up those to three different external systems just by adding as message extension. So you can put in your own application like a hook into this conversation, and when a person um, starts here, sorry, and clicks on a button like create task, then Planner takes it from there and creates a task based on the conversation that's available there. Um, that's pretty new and available through the API change that we can read messages in Teams now. So you can really take advantage of all the capabilities that the API allows you to do. You can take it from there and like the translate uh, functionality is there, I think, since a year or, or, or even more that takes basically the message and translate it with um, the Bing Translate service. And now you can also add your own hooks in there and take action on whatever is needed to do with a certain uh, message. Yep. Everything I said here again as a slide. Um, another cool thing is smart link unfurling. When you look at the example uh, on the right, we just see here a, a GitHub link. Um, and we all are used now to have previews and to have more information uh, when we post a link somewhere. So what you can also do is that you can implement it in a way that you can ask the external hyperlink, is there something available for me as a preview? That's called link unfurling. So you can show really in HTML a preview what the external link is providing. So if you think 
you're linking to your CRM system, to your ERP system, or whatever uh, system you want to connect to Teams, and you provide a link to that system, you as the developer of the third party system can then provide a preview so the teams can show already a preview and the heads up what's behind the link. Um, that's very important because teams, the idea of teams is to have the uh, team hub, or the hub for teamwork inside your Microsoft Teams environment and you want to reduce the context switches. So if I have a link to an external system and it already gives me a preview or already gives me an idea of what's going to go, if I've, well, what's behind the link if I go there, maybe I don't need to switch, maybe it's already in the preview that I need only this piece of information and can continue with my work. So that's a smart way of reducing the context switches or just to prepare you what's behind the link if you click on it. For example, GitHub even better. Um, you see here the different types, uh, just a hyperlink, then a simple preview, and then a really uh, taking advantage of what GitHub gives you, and then I can take action. Um, and then the next step is that you can also combine bots uh, with these task modules where you ask a bot, for example, and then the bot starts on the bottom here um, and it pops up also a task module so that you have a more focused experience. You're not lost in a conversation instead of Teams, what was uh, the usual way with a bot that you start with a bot and then it goes back and forth. In this case, you start with a bot and then it pops up a task module you fill out some question and the bot takes it from there. So it's a more tailored experience. It's more uh, helping the, the end user to stay on top of things and be focused and only the task you need to do. You see it here, everything else is a little bit grayed out. So you don't, you really see the focus uh, of the application. And then from there, uh, you go uh, further, create uh, the information for here, for example, for creating a poll, click on the button and then the bot takes it from there creates in that case just a simple poll for us. Um, those simple input forms can be done in a no-code way just defined as parameters in the manifest fail in a low-code way using an adaptive card or you can own the whole uh, real estate inside of a task module by hooking up your own application your own HTML uh, application and then you just use the Teams API to say okay I got the information, please close the window and you have your own experience inside of Teams as well. Um, here, uh, a short list of links before we jump over to some demos. Um, I will, oh, I missed one link here, I see. I will update that and we will make these slides available so you see all the references I'm making now for the demo because in uh, I have 15 minutes left and there's no way to show you all the great stuff really in the code, but all the examples are out there on GitHub and walkthroughs so you can take it from there and start development with Teams pretty soon. Okay, let's have a look inside uh, an example. I'm just opening up the correct browser. No, here we are. Yep, um, I've prepared here a, a simple theme um, that's just available inside of one of my tenants. And you see here uh, what we call in Teams the left rail. And the left rail holds all the different applications that are available for me as a person. Um, one simple thing I created just for this webinar, based on a, a video Vesa Juvenen uh, published last week, um, is just a bridge connecting my Teams experience with my local SharePoint experience. So I created an application inside of Teams that's just referencing some SharePoint lookbook demo pages um, inside my SharePoint environment. I created, not, I think, two different uh, yeah, um, designs from the lookbook. Um, to give you an example how you can hook up uh, your internet stuff also inside of Teams and to give an example how easy it is to create an application that is available in the left rail. How did I did that? Um, I have here my App Studio. That's one of the applications that is available inside the Microsoft Teams App Store. And when I click into that and I open the manifest editor for exactly my what I call internet bridge, you see here this is the tool where you define your applications. Um, in the end of the day, this application creates a JSON file, which is the manifest of your Teams application, and that then is uploaded by sideloading locally to your own uh, environment or to your local store, because you have also an app store for your own tenant, or if you go one step further and are a third party integrator, you can really uh, distribute the application to the global store. Then you need to go through the Microsoft way and publish your uh, application that way. 
But for us, for the simple case, I just created what's called a tab. And that's pretty easy. Uh, I can just add a personal tab here by providing two hyperlinks. In my case, I used the SharePoint URLs for the site collections I created. Um, just filled this out. And then under test and distribute, I can go install and install my uh, application only at what's called site loading inside my Teams environment. Uh, be aware of that. You need to go to your um, office admin page, your Teams admin center to allow site loading for application for that. But with this, I can easily go in there and hook up my app on the left rail here. Um, what I also can do is that I can use Teams app policies to define applications that are uh, shown only to a certain uh, group of users. So I can go in there and say, okay, um, I'm going to the Teams dashboard now, and I'm seeing my applications here. Uh, let's load this one. You see here a different uh, policy applied, and one is called the Internet Bridge. Uh, and what I did inside of those of this setting is that I said, okay, I want to have uh, a left rail experience like the following, my own stuff on top, and all the built-in uh, applications or features uh, from Teams, uh, the next version uh, down there. So to add something here, I can just click Add Apps uh, and select my own app and then create a policy, wait for 15 to 20 minutes until it's everything available, and then in Teams, uh, your application is on top of that. And what you can do now is that you can create your own experience and create a personal tab or personal application and every uh, person then is available uh, or this application is available to all the persons you defined in your app policy and you can create your own experience through and through. Um, let's go back to my team that I created. Um, what I can do now is uh, for one example, I can create a tab in Teams. So a tab is something like on top here where we can add uh, Word, PowerPoint, or whatever as a static file. I can add a tab that is uh, yeah, surfacing an iframe that is hosting a web application. But you can see here already, I can also add a SharePoint framework web part. So I can create a SharePoint framework web part. Um, I think uh, with SharePoint framework version 1.6 or 1.7, it will be available to uh, update or create already applications that are um, surfaced here as a Teams tab, because here I'm in an environment where I'm hosting uh, my data inside of a team, and this is a Teams tab, whereas on the left-hand side, this is my personal thing. So when I create an application here, this is a personal tab, and this is only available since the SharePoint uh, Framework version 1.10 that was released like a couple of weeks ago. So now with the latest SharePoint Framework version, you are able to create a Teams tab and a personal tab. And one, for example, would be here what we have in SharePoint in our own environment, uh, a modern task view. So it takes a couple of seconds, but then it loads here a web part. Uh, and when I jump over to the SharePoint site collection, just from the same team, so this is the same uh, backend site that is surfaced in Teams, I can show you here the same uh, SharePoint framework web part living inside of my SharePoint environment. This is just a, a sample web part that is, is uh, visualizing tasks from a task list in a more project manager way, but don't get carried away about the, the insights of the web part. It's more about how you can surface this also in Teams. So uh, what you can do is that you can go to your um, app catalog in, in SharePoint, and then there's a button on top that says sync to Teams. Um, and when you created your SharePoint framework version, uh, SharePoint framework solution to include uh, a Teams output, um, what you will get, for example, is here. Um, this is just a, a sample of web part uh, now surf, uh, showing some code. Um, if you create a Teams experience, you will get a Teams folder inside your uh, SharePoint framework solution. And if in this uh, folder, there's also a file called manifest JSON. And when you look here at line 27, what the system actually is creating is that it creates a hyperlink uh, to a layouts page inside of SharePoint and is referencing your component solution from the web part you're creating. And this um, zip file uh, that is created there, uh, you can upload to your Teams experience or you can go in really and say in the app catalog inside of SharePoint, because this is part of the package of the SharePoint framework uh, deliverable, 
you go in the app catalog click sync on teams and after a couple of minutes your solution is also available inside of your teams experience and like this you can click on modern task view we'll just do this again i think i should get a second tab now i don't want to post about it click on save you see uh, it just adds a one here um, and then it asks me uh, with the normal uh, settings from uh, my SharePoint web part, how should I call uh, the thing? So this is the normal property pane from your SPFX web part. And then I can go in there, reference a local list, and then web part is configured and available inside my Teams experience. So it's very easy to take uh, existing content uh, from SharePoint and make it available as a web part also in Microsoft Teams. The one thing, um, to take in consideration is that inside your SharePoint framework uh, solution, there's one important thing. Um, this is actually an, an older version with 1.10. It's even a, a different query, but you need to make sure that are you loaded as a SharePoint framework web pod or are you loaded inside of Teams um, so that you are aware of the context you are surfacing your information uh, to make sure that the application is aware of am I now loaded in Teams or am I now surfaced in Microsoft SharePoint? Uh, a little bit different in terms of user uh, of UI, for example, the Office UI Fabric stuff, you need to load in Teams as well because it's not available like it is in SharePoint. Um, and also if you think of, okay, in SharePoint, we have the concept of, of sites and, and, and uh, lists and all those things. Uh, in Teams, we have the Teams context, so I maybe want to know what is my team, what is my, my structure around that. And then there are different APIs you can query and make sure that you're okay in one context, I'm surfacing information from a site collection. And then another one, I'm going more for the group and team stuff and give back the information that is stored through that API. So this is a very, very good um, experience if you already uh, created some SharePoint framework web pods to make them available also in Teams. But this is just one example um, to create a tab. Um, of course, if you're coming from a SharePoint background, it seems like the more obvious one. Um, you don't need to take care of hosting your solution because this is done already by SharePoint Framework. So this thing lives in SharePoint and it's just surfaced here in Teams. So you don't need to take care of anything like a web page. But what you can also do um, is that you can take those things in your own hands. Um, let's switch back to... I think should be here, yeah. No, that's the same browser. Oh, browser lost. Huh, did I close the one? Interesting, doesn't matter, um, because I have an App Studio here as well. And the App Studio for me is not only uh, a way where you can create your manifest editor, but I really, really uh, encourage you to install the App Studio as soon as possible because it shows you what you can do also with an app. So it's a great example of what you can achieve with an app inside of Microsoft Teams because you have here different tabs. You have a manifest editor, you have a card editor, control library, and the about tab. And also you have a chat experience in there. So the App Studio itself is a Teams application. For example, I did some, some testing here uh, where you can have all the different things like searching. Uh, I can search here for, let's see, Microsoft Graph. It should reach out to docs.microsoft.com or some other um, uh, resources and query them and give some, some feedback back. Mm. Okay, that bot takes a couple of seconds, I don't mind. Um, but basically you have a, a, an extension here that is a, a chat window and then you really see, okay, um, in terms of what you can create from experience point, uh, if I go in there again, uh, I have a own web page uh, that is created uh, for uh, teams in a special way um, and that is hosted in some different environment. Um, in our case, most of the time we host the stuff, of course, in Azure. So there's an Azure web page that is then hooked up uh, to teams. And then you can really take the whole real estate, your whole window here and create your application that then helps your end users. And if you just start with development, um, of course, you need to uh, play with the App Studio because this gives you uh, a good overview and you need it to create your own applications. But just look at it from a different point of view, not only that you can, what the tool of, uh, is capable of doing, but also what the tool shows you and how you can do stuff and how you can create uh, experience there. 
if you look at the hyperlinks uh, that are part of my of my slide deck, there are pretty cool examples because you can create here simple HTML pages. You can do it with Node.js, you can do it with .NET Core Framework, you can make use of MVC pattern of Blazor, uh, you can go crazy with it. Uh, just take the Teams SDK, the JavaScript file with you, and then you're good to go. Um, and you can create then your own application that is more native uh, to Teams. But of course, uh, you need to take care of where to run the application and you make to make sure that this application is available to your end users all the time because it's not stored in SharePoint. It's more um, really stored um, inside uh, your own environment. So uh, with that, I think I don't want to steal a lot of more time because Stefan is now taking over and talks through all the stuff with the Bob framework, something I uh, left over. Um, and I would like to hand it over to Stefan now. Thanks, Tommy. Great, I'll just hand you over there now, one moment. Okay, Stefan, take it away. Great. Um, so a bit of slides before we before we start and, and uh, dive deeper into what the bot framework has to offer in terms of teams, teams development. Um, first of all, what are bots? For those of you who have never um, deal, dealt with bots, um, they're nothing more than just a computer program um, or nowadays, especially a web application, uh, which is designed to have that conversation with with a human being. Uh, and the, the, the first uh, premise or the, the main objective of a bot is always to solve the user's needs in the quickest and fastest way possible, meaning that uh, if you have a, a use case implemented uh, today and you want to replace that with a bot, for example, uh, make the internet search um, more intuitive, more natural or whatever, um, the bot's use case should always solve um, the user's needs in a quicker way than it did uh, before the bot was introduced. Um, and another fact is that with a bot, you can introduce artificial intelligence in general in a more friendly way because um, a lot of people are afraid of AI, of using AI, because they think actually that the the machines or, or, or the computers will take over their job uh, at some point in time. Uh, and by introducing a bot within your company, you can basically take the fear a bit out of the people uh, or your employees or, or coworkers and tell them, hey, this won't replace your job. This will actually be some kind of assistant for you. This will uh, solve some, some problems for you um, to make sure that you have the time to do more innovative stuff, to do like the fun stuff you want to do uh, and don't want to um, bother you with the routine work because this can be done by a bot as well. And um, in general, a uh, bot uh, typically looks like this. You have some kind of web application where you have some, some REST endpoints in place, uh, which are designed to actually are, be the interface between your bot's business logic and the channels you, you want to deploy your bot to. Then of course, um, you need to have some kind of SDKs in place in the Microsoft uh, world. This is the Bot Builder SDK, uh, which is available for you to actually uh, develop your bots. Um, at some point in time, you want to make sure that your bot that your bot will be intelligent as well. So you got to use some intelligent tools for that. Uh, Microsoft offers uh, what they call cognitive services, which is a set of roughly for, uh, 30 APIs uh, right now, which deliver you some kind of intelligence ranging from um, natural language processing to computer vision, um, to translation, to speech to text and whatever. Uh, and then you make want to make uh, use of the platform services uh, Microsoft offers you um, to actually host your bot at, on some kind of platform uh, and to make sure that your bot is able um, to be reached out uh, by, by your users and, and the bot is available all the time. Uh, so breaking it down, Microsoft offers you a lot of tools and pieces for you to build what they call a conversational AI experience, uh, meaning a bot. So they, uh, they've they introduced their own SDK, their own framework, which is called the bot framework, um, 
it is kind of like the the base for building your bots. Um, it offers you a great uh, development experience across uh, a lot of programming languages. You're not only um, you know you don't only need to use C sharp all the time. You can use JavaScript or TypeScript, or you can even use uh, Java or Python to build your bot. Um, on top of that, you have a uh, managed bot service, which is called the Azure Bot Service, um, to a, to to host your bot actually on top of Azure. But what you can also do is to host your bot on your premises in your local data center. You can host it in AWS, uh, Google Cloud Platform, and the Azure Bot Service makes sure that your channels uh, where you want to deploy your bot to, like Teams or like uh, Skype or Facebook Messenger or whatever, um, actually reach out to your bot, which is then hosted either in Azure or any other cloud uh, data center provider. Um, and messages are able to, to go back and forth between the user and your bot successfully. On top of that, um, so by that uh, point, the bot actually is nothing more than a web application with some, some special features, um, but it's nothing more than a web app. Um, so it's not that uh, intelligent as you might think because it's just a web app. The intelligence comes from uh, pre-trained AI services in form of the cognitive services um, which, as, as I said, offer you great uh, uh, ability to, to infuse AI in some way within your, within your bot, may it be in a vision category, may it be uh, for speech services or language or whatever. Um, and those are the APIs you need to combine to actually um, build up uh, an intelligent bot or intelligent uh, experience for your end users. Um, on top of that, you have um, a lot of templates, a lot of samples out there. Um, you have uh, templates or solution accelerators for different uh, verticals, business verticals, which are mainly uh, pre-filled projects or solutions. You can get it for, for your Visual Studio or for VS Code. Um, and you just need to fill in your data and you're, you're ready to go within a couple of hours uh, with, your, with your bot. Um, and as we saw earlier in Tommy's uh, Teams client, there are a lot of bots out there already uh, within Teams. Cortana is using it. Um, and the other, the other uh, part would be Power Virtual Agent, where you have that kind of SaaS, uh, SaaS solution for building bots. So the bot framework itself, as I said, is available in C Sharp and JavaScript in GA. Um, Python and Java still in preview. Um, we are now in version four, so we have come, we have came, we we came from version three, uh, and I guess version four is now roughly two years GA, one and a half years, I guess, um, and it changed a lot. So if you're a developer who is experienced with uh, bot framework version three, uh, and you want to start with version four, uh, the whole pattern has changed. It's more modular. It's more open. The the architecture behind or the, the framework is more extensible. Um, and you got our new revamped dialogue system in it. Um, the cool thing about it is it shares the same implementation um, across all the uh, programming languages. So you, you if you build a bot today for C sharp and tomorrow um, with, with JavaScript, you don't uh, you don't need to rethink Oh, how do, you, do I do this in JavaScript? I, did, I know I did this in C Sharp that way, but how is it working out in JavaScript? It's the same uh, across all the platforms and across all the, the languages. So um, for developers, there's a, there's a really uh, cool experience to, to build a bot. You got some rich uh, visual controls in it, uh, especially adaptive cards are a thing which, which are coming even more and more supported within the channels. Um, there's a seamless integration in, into your Azure uh, tenant, of course, with the cognitive services and all that. Um, you got a support for OAuth. So if you want to do authentication within your bot, you can do it with OAuth now. Um, and the, the, the whole tool chain and the, the whole uh, ecosystem is quite rich and modern. Um, so you can build your bot um, purely in .NET Core with Visual Studio Code, you don't have to use Visual Studio um, for building a bot and so on and so forth. You got a lot of CLIs 
um, which are which are available out there to help you build your bot, scaffolding your solution, um, deploying the the stuff to Azure, um, using Azure DevOps or GitHub uh, to to build up a CI/CD pipeline and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of channels. Uh, there are a lot of channels which are supported uh, natively. So you got the Microsoft ones like Teams, like Skype, uh, like Cortana, but you also got uh, third parties like Facebook Messenger, um, Kick, Twilio for sending SMS uh, or text messages. You got uh, support for Slack, uh, and the community even um, has brought up a, a solution to integrate with Amazon Alexa or Google Assistant. So you can even um, build your bot framework bot for Alexa or for your Google Assistant um, devices. There's another thing uh, in terms of channel integration, which is uh, which deals with handoff, human handoff. Um, so really soon you'll be able to also uh, have that human handoff capability natively built into the bot framework. Um, and as a first uh, step, there uh, they're integrating and supporting live person. Uh, as a as a system for handing off to uh, and, and more support coming soon as well. Um, so if you're if you're starting if you start to build bots, there are mainly three ways of of building bots. Um, first one would be the the most uh, the most fastest one, building a bot using Q and A Maker. Q and A Maker is one of those cognitive services um, where you build your knowledge base, and if you're done building a knowledge base. Um, you, you have a button uh, where you can just say, okay, I want to make a bot out of it, which takes you to the Azure portal, um, creates a bot for you, hooks it up to that Q&A maker knowledge base, and that's it. So you're good to go within a couple of minutes with your, with your knowledge base bot. Um, the second option would be using the bot framework, so really developing bots, and that's what, we, what we'll, we'll be seeing uh, later on as well. And the third one would be starting with some kind of templates, uh, solution accelerators like the virtual assistant. Um, to not start with a blank template, but uh, start with something which is already pre-filled for you. Um, so speaking about virtual assistant, um, this is like the, the main vision um, of Microsoft, um, how your whole bot use case could look like. Um, so basically, um, you should build your assistant for either um, uh, various users, for your teams, for your company, whatever, and build like a brand, um, brand it, give it a personality, incorporate cognitive services in there, maybe speech, um, maybe language understanding, maybe even vision um, to broaden up the use case. Then of course, leverage the Azure Bolt service to deploy your bot or integrate your bot with the various channels, um, use various input types because um, a text only bot is not, not the, the best bot you can build. Um, make sure to use, for example, adaptive cards to make the whole look and feel more appealing um, and give your users some kind of uh, advice with, with buttons, what they can do with the bot. Um, and to, to navigate the, the whole conversation flow with, for example, buttons. Um, and what you can also do is to integrate your bot not only within your browser or within your um, PC, you can also integrate your bot with, as I said, Amazon Alexa, for example, as a smart device. You can also build your bot for your car um, because BMW uh, is, is currently working on a solution where they are trying to replace their whole inboard entertaining system um, with the bot framework. So in the future, you might say, hey, bot, turn up the heating, or hey, bot, uh, I want to uh, listen to that uh, soundtrack on Spotify, for example, within your BMW car. And what what's basically underlying is the bot framework, which, which does the whole business logic and the whole um, inter recognition and so on and so forth, and then just uh, takes the action for you. Um, uh, another uh, quite common use case for a virtual assistant might be to, to serve uh, as some kind of knowledge management solution. Um, so you can integrate with Q&A Maker, of course, but you can also integrate with any other data source. Um, if you have, for, for example, an HR system where your data is stored 
and the knowledge is stored. You can integrate with that as well to get the knowledge into your bot uh, and make sure that your users can uh, ask your bot on the go about some kind of information which is stored in the HR system. Um, and what Microsoft also did is to align that uh, development approach a bit with, with how Amazon does it with, with their skill approach. So right now you'll be able to uh, not only develop bots, but you can also develop skills, um, which is nothing more than a bot actually, um, but you can incorporate or integrate that skill then into another bot. So um, what you can basically do then is to split up the whole development uh, life cycle to say, team A um, is responsible for the mail skill, team B is responsible for the uh, task skill, and they can basically develop the skills um, on their own. And if they're done, you just uh, integrate those skills into a virtual assistant, for example. Uh, as it is a Microsoft framework and a Microsoft solution, of course, you can in integrate all the Microsoft APIs out there, um, the Office Graph, you can integrate Azure Active Directory for authentication and authorization, for example, um, and that's quite easy to do. Um, so speaking about developing your bot, your first bot maybe, um, there are a lot of phases uh, or stages within your development project you will run through, um, starting with the plan phase. Um, so this is kind of the, the mock-up or design phase um, you might think of, where you basically offer your dialogues, um, you design the cards you want to you wanna send to, uh, to the users, you want to kind of visualize it, um, doing uh, prototyping or mocking up the, the whole bot conversation. Um, when you're done with planning it, of course, you do. Uh, you then go to the build phase where you leverage the SDK to build your bot. Um, you can also build your bot without coding it, uh, which we'll see later on, um, using the Microsoft Bot Framework Composer, which is a visual IDE for building bots. Um, after you've built it, you want to test it. So there's an emulator out there which you can use to test your bot actually um, locally before you deploy it to Azure or any other um, platform. Um, after you've tested it, of course, you can publish it. Um, you can either do that via CLI, um, publishing the content. Uh, you can do it with Visual Studio. Um, or you can uh, be more sophisticated and integrate your bot within your CI CD pipelines, where you make sure that you get a continuously um, you can you continuously deploy your bot um, within your within your development lifecycle. And after you've uh, deployed your bot, you can connect it to the various channels as we've seen earlier. Um, and the cool thing here is, as I need to mention, um, you build your bot just once. And then you connect your bot to the various channels. And that's that's really cool. You don't have to build your bot one time for Teams um, and the second time for Skype um, because um, the whole uh, implementation uh, idea is to build your bot once and then run it on every channel, if you if you will. It's a bit of the same like um, with the universal Windows platform back in the days, build once, run everywhere. Um, of course, the channels themselves, they have some kind of um standalone features which only one channel supports but the other don't, don't um like we saw earlier the task module within teams this is a team specific feature you don't get that for example in facebook messenger so you got to be aware of where you, where you want to connect your bot to um, and if you need to kind of uh, adapt your business logic within your bot to say okay if the bot is uh, deployed in teams i'll go this way and if the bot is deployed in Facebook Messenger, I'll go that way. And then um, the, the longest running phase begins after you connect it, because then the evaluation of your bot begins. Um, so always keep in mind to uh, not only build your bot once uh, and then you're done. Make sure to evaluate it to, to uh, check out what the user's feedback is, um, where you can refine something. Um, where you can adapt something to, to continuously improve your bot. Um, and with that, last slide of today, before we go into the demo, um, quite new thing, Bot Framework Composer, which has been announced at Ignite uh, last year. 
which is still in preview. Um, but this is kind of uh, like a game changer for building bots because it's a visual editor for actually building your bots. So you don't have to go into your uh, Visual Studio code or Visual Studio or any other IDE to build your bot using code. You can do that um, by just simply um, doing that with a visual interface and we'll, we'll check that out right now. So if I now go to my, where do I have it? Composer, so this is the, the composer tool um, and I wanna build a new bot. You see, you can either start from scratch or you can start with a template, which we'll do in, in that case. Um, so I'll go, I'm going to pick the Q&A Maker and Lewis template. Just give it a name, ESPC bot, um, and then that's it. And the whole um, bot project scaffolding um, will be done by the composer. Um, so you got some, some triggers in there for help or for buying a surface or whatever. Uh, it has a welcome message in there. Um, the whole the language understanding part is also integrated within Composer. So here I define my language model within my Composer um, bot, um, where I can say help is one intent. I wanna define by surface is another one. And if the intent um, is not known, I'll be straight uh, straight going directly going to q a maker to to see if there's an answer for for the question um, the user has entered um, and that's pretty much it so if i now um, just want to adapt something because uh, i'm not a fan of of text only messages um, but i want to actually send out the greeting card i can do that um, so as you can see here uh, the, the the visual canvas is quite easy to to manage um, within my responses. I can just type in any uh, any text I want to, um, and in that case, I want to send out an attachment as a greeting. Um, so I can send uh, can say I want to send out the JSON file which I need to define, and the JSON file um, usually will be defined in my bot responses. So here are all the responses the bot actually. Um, will deliver to the users in the various dialogues for various triggers or whatever. Um, so I'll just copy in some 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 JSON, which I have come up with earlier. So this is my whole JSON representative of my adaptive card, um, and it has the name adaptive card JSON. So from my attachment activity, I just reference that variable if you want to, or that function if you want to. Um, and this will then be uh, pasted into my bot. Um, so going back to my to my uh, welcome dialog, now we see here if a new user enters the conversation, it will be created using the adaptive card, which we have defined. Um, what you also can do within Composer is not only send responses, um, but you can also go ahead and ask questions, for example, um, where you expect either text input, number input, confirmation, what have you. Uh, you can also work with conditions, so you can actually um, build your, your switch cases in there. You can build loops. You can also um, build real dialogues. So on the left-hand side, we see we just have one dialogue in place right now. Well, we could add uh, multiple dialogues in here and then uh, we could begin a new dialogue upon the greeting or what have you. Um, you can also work with, with uh, variables. So you can define initialized variables. You can set them, you can um, read them and so on and so forth. And you can also access external resources. So you could easily send out an HTTP request um, to an API, for example, um, to your HR API. Uh, which is running on your premises, um, for example, uh, and then grab the data from there and uh, infuse it in, into the uh, bots conversation. So if I'm now done uh, actually creating my bot, I can go ahead and start it. Uh, and all I need for starting it is a Lewis key. Um, Lewis, where did I, oh, there's a white space in there. Lewis is the, the cognitive service um, 
offering language understanding. So right now, what happens is that Composer is taking my language model, which is defined in Markdown here, um, and creating a new language understanding app for me within my Azure tenant, um, and make sure that my bot is hooked up to that Lewis application um, to get the intents from the language model, which is the, which has been defined via Markdown here. If it's done, um, the second uh, thing which Composer will do is to actually start my bot on my local host. So I can then go ahead and, and test my, my bot within my, oh, uh, there's, there's an error. As I said, it's preview. So um, you can run into, into uh, errors all the time, but I'll go ahead and switch back to a bot I've created earlier. Uh, which does the, the exactly the same. Um, so I'm going to publish it. If the language understanding model uh, has been published, uh, the bot com bot framework composer will will execute your bot locally, um, and then you can test it within the emulator. So if I go ahead and test it now, we should see that the bot will be uh, will be greeting me with the adaptive card. So it should uh, should send us an adaptive card. And with the emulator, as you can see on the right hand side, you can even have a look at the traces so you can see what's going on in there. Um, so I got the adaptive card. Now I can ask what is the V4 SDK, for example, um, which is part of a question coming from QA Maker, and I'll get the answer from there. So what I have done um, before, because this would take quite some time, is I've deployed that bot to my Azure tenant. So if I go ahead, um, and switch to my Azure portal. This is the bot that I have deployed in here um, with the same adaptive card reading um, and the same uh, the same business logic behind it. So if I now go ahead and ask what is the V4 SDK, it will give me the same answer. Um, and now, how do I actually get my bot into my Teams uh, Teams app or, or Teams uh, platform? Um, if you switch to channels within your Azure bot service bot, uh, you see that you can actually click on the Teams icon there uh, and then just say, okay, I want to make my uh, bot available in Teams. Need to agree to the terms of service. And that should be should be it from the bot side of things. Um, and now what I need in order to actually add my bot to Teams is the Microsoft App ID. So this is the unique ID for the bot um, within my Azure AD tenant. And now if I switch to my Teams client, I can go to the App Studio, uh, to the manifest editor and create a new application and just give it a name like Alfred, um, generate an app ID, which is the Teams app ID, not the, the bot app ID. Um, give it some kind of package name, io. This uh, version 1.0.0. Uh, give it just a short description, which can, of course, be anything you like. And um, I need the developer info. Uh, and if you're planning to build a bot for your for the global Teams App Store make sure that this uh, information is accurate um, and on point because this will be visible for each and every user uh, who is actually installing the the application into the into his or her teams client um, of course you can you can upload um, icons and, and brand your bot and this is this is the the, the these are the basic app details and now we want to go ahead and add our bots to that Teams application. So we click on um, bots under capabilities uh, and say we already have a bot um, and paste in the Microsoft app ID. And then we can select if the bot uh, is should be supporting um, file up and download, uh, if it's just a one-way notification bot, if the bot is also capable of doing audio and video calls, and what's the scope of the bot. So I'll pick all three of them. Personal is in a one-on-one -on -one scenario, team is within a channel and group chat would be um, 
a group of people uh, having a chat, not a full team. Um, so now I should be able to install my bot, and I don't have to. I don't have the permission to do that um, because obviously I'm not an administrator in that uh, tenant, but I'll simply switch to another tenant where I have the permissions and I can show you um, the implementation of a bot uh, right there. So if I just close the other browser tabs, um, I should be having my Teams App Studio in there and there I can show you what the installation routine will look like for a bot um, which has already been uh, created. So as you can see here, branding, um, you can work with icons. Um, then you can, of course, uh, insert other capabilities as well. So uh, an app can not only con consist of a bot, but also you can add tabs and connectors and what have you. And if you go ahead and install it, just simply click on add, then it will be installed for you. Um, and if you wanna uh, be may, uh, distribute the, the bot for, for all users in your organization, you just have to um, push it to your company's app store and then you have it within your, um, within your team's uh, app uh, catalog for each and every user, which is part of your organization. Um, the other thing, how you can test your bot in Teams is just simply adding your app ID to the search box on the top, then switch to people, and there you find your bot. Um, and then you can basically say same thing as we saw earlier, what is the V4 SDK? Um, and it should give us the correct answer. So it will greet us with the adaptive card and it will give us the answer, um, which is coming from Q&A Maker. With that, I guess we're, finished um for today so um wrapping up developing bots don't only have to do with coding um so you can use composer still in preview for building bots um, but it's a great tool um, to get used to uh the whole architecture the whole patterns and routines within within the bot framework um, and we'll also cross the bridge between developers and, and power users. Um, so you can build great bots um, with Composer um, from now on. Good, Shane. Do we have any, any questions already? Yes. Yes, Stefan, uh, we do. We have like literally two minutes, so I'll, I'll run through pretty quick. Okay, first question in is, uh, what's the difference between the bot framework version 3 and version 4? Good. Yeah, so as I said, um, version three was very basic. Um, in V3, you could not do um, things like, um, how do they call it? Um, team specific features and with version four, you get the whole, um, you get a whole bot framework teams SDK, which you, you, you can't use for version three. Um, you got a whole lot of support for using all the cognitive services in version four. Um, compared to version three, where you were very, uh, very limited with that, and uh, in general, version four is, is, is has uh, has evolved a lot compared to version three, and you you're quite more flexible um, when you go with v four than you would uh, be with v three. Okay, uh, is it Office Graph or Microsoft Graph in the virtual assistant slide that you showed? It's the Office, yeah, but. It's the Office 365 graph, so Microsoft graph would be the correct wording. Okay. The Brilliant. Microsoft graph. Um, out of three methods, which is the most efficient way to create a bot? The most efficient way would be, uh, it depends on, on who you are and what your skills are. Um, if, if by efficient you mean fast, it would be the first one going with Q&A Maker or as we saw now we're using Composer because it's just a matter of minutes to build a bot with those uh, with those lightweight tools, as I would say. Okay. Uh, hi, Stefan. The Power Virtual Agent, the new way to create easily a bot with zero code. What is your experience, suggestion, pros, cons, comparing with Azure Bot Framework? Um, Power Virtual Agent is 
designed for for power users um so you're a bit limited in terms of what you can do right now um because all or or mostly all of the uh, power virtual uh, agent features are dependent on microsoft or microsoft power automate um so you're quite limited uh in terms of what power automate has to offer um and you got to to use that so for example if you want to hook your bot up to your custom uh hr service um you need to make sure that power automate is supporting that if it's not supporting that you need to go with some kind of development then like azure functions or or what have you um and with the bot framework you're quite more quite more flexible and agile in terms of what you can use Great. Um, Stefan, Thomas, uh, on behalf of the ESPC community, thank you so much for taking the time today to complete this webinar. We really appreciate it. Thanks for having us. Pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you both. Okay, everybody. Uh, again, uh, this is the end of today's webinar. Please see SharePointEurope.com for further details on all upcoming webinars or visit our resource center for all previous episodes. Uh, don't forget, if you're interested in taking part in ESPC 19 or call for, or, sorry, ESPC 20, I should say, our call for speakers is now open. And also don't forget to sign up for our 30% discount code, which is happening on Thursday the 27th of February. Uh, thank you all for joining today and thank you again especially to Thomas Goels and Stefan Bisser. Take care and goodbye.